Whatever happened to Takako Mamiya? If you know her, it's on the YouTube sidebar. What about now? Yeah, the, the spinning cat one. That video is one of the biggest tracks of online city pop. Her entire album, not too far behind it. Many of us freaks that listen to city pop consider it one of the greatest albums in the genre. So, start with the Big Bang, right? Then we go to matter as we know it. And you know, this is all window dressing. I'll, I'll explain this in my 50-page uh, thesis on Takako Mamiya being a, a deity figure. But, you know, all of this leads, this is all window dressing to this fact that Takako Mamiya is, in fact, God. Yeah, you said it. But that's not all that makes it special. Takako Mamiya is like a mythic figure only appearing once in a blue moon. That last blue moon appeared in 1982. It was at the release of her first and last LP, Love Trip. We haven't heard nor seen of her since. Putting out one classic, then gone. But big deal, right? There are plenty of one-hit wonders who vanish. Musical careers aren't for everyone. And for sure, Takako might be living her life as just another housewife, or working in a Chinese restaurant, who knows? But it's her reignition into the digital landscape which elevated her story to new levels. Considered notoriously rare back in the bubble era of Japan, Love Trip didn't do well in the charts. So an original copy sells like gangbusters now. To the surprise of record officials, the album gained a cult following, leading to another physical release 30 whole years later. A CD that was digitized as soon as it landed. Sure, there were some snippets that ended up on YouTube beforehand, but this one and this particular track piqued those early adopters' ears. What is this blend of melancholy and jazz pop? Mayo Naka No Joke was written by lyricist Ichigo Takahana and composed by Hiroyuki Nanba. It's fantastic. That shiny sharp mix into the late night vibes, the flowing horns that wash over that tight bass, with the marching beat that takes you on the ride downtown, and the subtle synth piano that keeps it all together as you are drenched in its dour vocals. <laughs> Bringing you to a world of late night driving in the lonely city full of regrets, an ex-lover in the passenger seat, but maybe that was just a bad joke, a thought about different times. Tears in the eyes, we all know that sort of late night loneliness that almost encompasses a lot of city pop's sort of flavour. And how could I forget to mention the unsung hero of the track, it's Latin percussion. Yeah. Yeah. The guitar solo erupts for its final moments, giving the track a bit of bite before it caps off. Some of those early videos were lost in the great copyright war, but the spinning cap survived, exploding alongside the now infamous Plastic Love, getting people to ask, who is Takako anyway? Where'd she go? Takako popped into the scene in the late 70s as a fresh-faced individual. She appeared on one single by name beforehand. The single described her as a new and up-and-coming folk and rock sort of musician. But she never stayed with the band. She left and eventually got picked up by Kitty Records, where Takako released Love Trip. Now Kitty, they began as sort of a music company that composed TV soundtracks, but expanded as the years went on to be more of a movie studio, doing a lot of anime adaptations during the 80s of works like Yurisei Yatsura and other 80s as heck stuff. It's through Kitty Records we get some of the most striking stuff about the album, which is the talent behind it. There's a ton of great session musicians from that subgenre. They were a dedicated group and a lot of musicians flipped around, so it's no surprise. We have members of Tatsuro Yamasta's band, some which she might have met during the PAO days, especially the drummer. Another pivotal role would be the bassist, who played for the prolific Cassiopeia, Yoshihiro Naruse. Yeah, that's some good bass, mm, yeah, really, really helps bring those tracks together. Among a ton of great compositioners, lyricists, and all manner of other people. Now, I'm sure they were using this album to try and compete with RCA and, you know, get her on the stage with the other big girls. But the question of money was just not on her side. It was a very competitive market, you can say. Yet musically, they are really on par. It's, a, it's just such a wonderful album. Especially, like I said, the talent of people like, of course, you know, the brass section is great. And some of them went on to play on things like Cowboy Bebop. What a, what a crazy comparison, eh? I was just talking about that not so long ago. Oh, that composer, that's really good. Oh yeah, that one, definitely great. All these people just make it such a wonderful time. Wait a minute, 
wait, wait a minute. Jackie Chan had a musical career? And this person composed it? Well, what is my life? No, this can't be true. This can't be true. All right, all right. Um, all right, well, let's just, let's try it out. See how it sounds. I'm, I'm not going to judge it too hard at the beginning. Oh, no, it's, it's trash. It's terrible. Oh, this is, this is bad. Um, Jackie should have stuck to martial arts. Uh, he, he really dropped off hard there. Well, maybe it was just like a one-time thing. Yeah. You know, we all, we all like make mistakes. <laughs> oh, he, he has 13 original albums. So, so this man has 13 albums, not including greatest hits, and Takako only gets one. What, what kind of world do we live in? <laughs> All right, let's just change the subject for a minute. The cover, too, builds on that rogue aesthetic of a lonely night in the neon city, and I think that's what's helped it grow in the digital age. Sort of definitely gives you that feeling of lonely nights and neon cities and... Okay, okay. Oh, boy. You don't get to see that part on YouTube. Let's just... Let's just move that. There we go. There we go. Let's forget about that. Oh, God. What were they thinking? Did they just not move that? Like, who was doing this? Oh, yeah, I know that name. That's uh, Terahisa Tejima. Yeah, they actually worked on some professional covers. I'm pretty sure I've seen one before. That's quite familiar to me. Yeah. I even used it in one of my videos. Huh. Things are getting kind of familiar around here, actually. Oh, a composer from Space Dandy as well? Hmm. Huh. It's getting a bit weird. But yeah, all this must have led to the humble beginnings. You know, back in 2010, it was rising on Discogs and other sort of online platforms among a worldwide audience. And then it got that new release. And then went on to like a limited vinyl run on HMV. There were only 500 copies. To then getting a full run. And then getting a new run right now. In a post by Come Along Radio, they infer that Takako didn't necessarily leave the industry after her album. She was sort of taking on roles in ads and probably some background voice work and maybe even, I mean, this is my speculation, maybe she even got behind the, uh, behind the music as a producer. And perhaps that's why we're seeing a random album from the 80s that was almost forgotten just pop up again 30 years later. Well, I did some more digging and I did find that in 2012, when they were re-releasing this for the first time, it was in tandem with both a Tower Records and Light Mellow sort of deal where they were trying to find lost records from the time that were hidden gems and re-release them to the public. And of course, that worked out in spades for Takako. You'd think now, since uh, her following has gotten so rapid, that she wouldn't have kept herself in the shadows. Uh, I mean, at this point, it must be intentional, right? That mystery is alluring. It's fun to sort of speculate in uh, almost part of the appeal, because you, you never know what you're going to find out. Like, all those coincidences, you never know what that could mean. I'm sure it makes those royalty checks taste all the sweeter. The intrigue keeps people coming back, and if it keeps it in people's attentions, they're more likely to buy it. But I'll say this, Miss Mamiya, if you ever want to talk, my door is always open. And if anyone knows any stuff, uh, feel free to share, but just don't get creepy about it. Like, respect her privacy. Let's not go wild with speculation. Like, that would just be silly, right? We might need a bit of a sound engineer if we ever did, like, an interview, though. I mean, maybe maybe we can, like, dig out the person who did the sound engineering on Love Trip. That would be funny, wouldn't it? Yeah, but what's her name again? Let's, let's just check it out. Takashi Shimasu, eh? Um, what, what did they do? Wait, the, ma the person that made the grudge? Really? He was the, he was the sound engineer on this? That, that can't be true. I mean, those films have good sound design. I wouldn't be surprised, but tell me in the comments if this is true. I want it to be true. I'll probably just ignore you if you say it isn't true. Wait, oh, that looks looks like it is true. It all, it all, it all makes sense now. No, I'm thinking about it. All those random coincidences. Takako... She never left, did she? She's always been with us, floating through cyberspace, waiting for us to hear her ghostly calls. I think Takako might be some sort of a aesthetic space ghost. The reason she didn't make any more music is she's always been within the machine. A ghost in the machine. The ghost of City Pop, with a grudge against her lack of royalties, while spreading her musical jams across the interweb. What, what was that? What was that noise? Oh no. I must know too much. They're going to come for me. I guess it was a good run. Oh, before I go, then, I'd just like to thank everyone that's helped me on this project. Sun Huxtable for making his video. Come Along Radio. Jay Kanek of the website. Dennis for his beautiful illustration. You can check out his channel there. Loose Lovelace for letting me use some of her photos and those collages. And I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of others. I'll just, I'll have to name that. And of course, you can always support me on my...